as is par for the course. Let's take a look back now on the Week in Review. Mr. Ron Ingracia, he is the driver of the week. He has reached the 50 win plateau with doubles on Wednesday and Saturday. He is now tied with Joe Rico Jr. for second place in wins. Mr. John Gilmore had a triple on Thursday. He won singles on Wednesday, Friday, and Sunday. His win total is now up to 107 as he shoots for the all-time mark. Jimmy Allen, a double on Thursday, a single on Sunday. He has 44 wins on the year, fifth on the dash win list. Mr. Ronnie Shore, a double on Wednesday, a single on Saturday. Ronnie Shore now has 17 wins on the season. And Joe Pokey Romano, a driving double on Tuesday, singles on Friday and Saturday, a good week for Joe. He now has 27 wins on the year. And that's our week in review. And one driver who we didn't have a slide of is Mr. D. Robert Flamme. He had a double on 825, and we congratulate him for that. Time now for the highlight calls of the week, and we take you to the Daily Double on Sunday, August 30th at Monticello Raceway. That's the first and second race. First of all, the first race, Tijuana Brass with Catello Manzi. That's right, Catello Manzi made a mighty M appearance on this Sunday. He was in the sulky, the morning line favorite. He went to the top early from the seven hole and set fractional times of 29 and 4 and 1 minute and 3 fifths. Let's watch and see if he can hold on. So let's set the stage for you. Sunday, August 30th, race number one. Let's now go to the call of this race with Mr. Jerry Glantz. Tijuana Brass on top of lane. Fly Fly Scott on the outside, second verbatim at the rail, third. Racy and the outside is fourth. Jack's Wild along the rail, fifth. Three quarters in 131 flat. Addict turn the final time. Tijuana Brass holds on to the lead. Fly Fly Scott still coming out of the outside. Verbatim along the rail is third. Racy and the outside, fourth. Jack's Wild, fifth. They've got an eighth of a mile at the pace. Now they turn for home. Tijuana Brass at the rail. Fly, fly, Scott down the middle of the track. Race the Andy and Jacks Wild to the lane. Tijuana Brass. Race the Andy is going to win it all. Race the Andy with Martin Kenny in the sulky. Won that race two minutes and one-fifth. The horse paid 28.20 to win Tijuana Brass, by the way, came in third. The second part of the Daily Double, obviously, was the race that came after race number one. And Miss Cabert with Catello Manzi again in the sulky was the morning line favorite again out of the seven hole. Clippers Pry with Ronnie and Gracia set the pace from the one hole. The fractions were 28 and 4 and a one minute even. But Storm Lord started to move up the backstretch. And let's see what happens. So let's set the stage for you. Sunday, August 30th, race number two. Let's go to the call. Cabot right there, fourth. The Joker along the rail, fifth. They're by three quarters, 131 and three. Paddock turn the final time. Clippers pride by a half length. Storm Lord in the outside is second. The Joker third. Miss Cabot three wide, fourth. Alfano Hanover racing, fifth. They've got an eighth of a mile at the pace. Now they turn for home. Storm Lord getting the lead. Clippers pride at the rail. Miss Cabot in the outside. To the lane, Storm Lord with the lead. Miss Cabot with a late rush on the outside. Storm Lord and Miss Cabot. Storm Lord in front. And as you saw, Storm Lord with Rich Yakin the sulky pulled away for that victory. The horse paid twelve dollars. The Daily Double paid two hundred fifty-two dollars and twenty cents. Miss Cabot with Cat Manzi in the sulky came in second. And those are the highlight calls from the past week at Monticello Raceway. Coming up on the personality profile, we profile a man, Mr. Bill Brown, and a horse. Most happy fellow. We'll have that for you right after this message. Now y'all just know this is the mighty Mississippi. Don't you know? Surprise! Every place you see here is in New York State. Because New York has more to see and do than most countries. Call for a free vacation guide that shows you where everything is. Now let's hand for old Dixie. <laughs>
inside track has gotten to many places in the last few weeks around Monticello Raceway, showing you the starting car, showing you the photo finish. Well, on today's show, we're going to take you to where it all begins, and that is the horse farm. And I'm standing here on a beautiful morning with the manager of Blue Chip Farms in Walk Hill, New York, Mr. Bill Brown. Bill, welcome to the inside track on a truly magnificent morning. Thank you, Gary. Bill, why don't we start out by uh, talking a little bit about Blue Chip and how many acres and, and just a little bit about the farm in general. Yes, the Blue Chip Farm is approximately about 12 years old. It was uh, owned by Mr. Oscar Kittle and his two sons, Oscar, <coughs> Ted and Mike, and uh, it comprises of 846 acres. We have uh, 607 acres in, garden, in, uh, the, in the town of uh, Shawanga near Walk Hill, and the balance of it, uh, the land is here in Gardner. Now, who stands at Blue Chip Farm? Most happy fellow, <laughs> and precious fellow. And most happy fellow, for those who don't know, one of the most successful studs in the history of racing, I would imagine. Yes, he's been a phenomenal sire, Gary. As a matter of fact, in 79 and 80, his offspring won more, had more earnings of any stud of any breed. Okay, we'll talk about Most Happy Fellow mm -hmm. in a little while. What about the personnel at, at uh, a farm such as this? How many people are employed, and what does it take to run a farm such as this? Well, we have 31 employees here, uh, regular employees, plus some part-time employees. Now, this, for those who don't know, is a breeding farm. Explain for the average layman what the step-by-step -step process is uh, for a horse to come to Blue Chip Farm? Well, we have a receiving area where all incoming mares arrive. These mares are checked in and remain in that area for approximately two to three weeks to f see that they're free of any disease, mm -hmm. that they're healthy. After the 21-day period, then they, they, were they are allocated out to a permanent uh, location for the duration of their stay here during the breeding season. Now, how does one sign up to uh, be bred to most happy fellow or, or to be bred to precious fellow? Well, we, uh, when they request a booking to these horses, we send out an application, which is referred to it as a booking application, which gives a complete breeding of the mare, her past history, if she's, been, if she's had several foals, who the foals have been by, or what they, what they have done, if they're foals of racing, uh, they're of, of racing age. And uh, we review these applications and then if acceptable, I we send them a breeding contract. Now, the fee for Most Happy Fella, I believe, is $40,000 is the stud fee. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, in simple terms, if someone has a horse and they have $40,000, then can they uh, be bred to Most Happy Fella? If the mare is acceptable. And speaking of the service fee of 40000 it's on a live foal basis. In other words, so they book the mare, the service fee is due and payable when the mare has a live foal. Now, what about, we talked uh, several weeks ago about teasing and so on and so forth. What's, what's involved with actually getting the horses uh, together? Well, when the mares, these mares arrive here, they're allocated like the, the maiden mares are allocated to, uh, with other maidens. The folding mares are allocated to, according to their folding dates and also the barren mares. Now, the barren and maiden mares, we, uh, we tease those mares with a teaser. A teaser is a, is a stud to see if they're receptive to find out when they are in heat or, 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 or estrus. And uh, when the mare is, we try to breed these mares as close to ovulation as possible. When the mare is in uh, the height of her estrus, our veterinarian, Dr. Gill, palpates this mare to see if she has a breedable follicle. If it's breedable, then we, we will go ahead and we breed the mare, check her back to see if she has ovulated. If she hasn't ovulated, why then we'll uh, breed her back and, and oftentimes, not I'll say oftentimes, but occasionally we'll give them uh, so, uh, an injection of hormones to stimulate ovulation. Now, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, the breeding is done by artificial insemination? Yes. Could you, uh, without getting too technical uh, so people wouldn't understand uh, exactly uh, what the process is? Well, here at Blue Chip, we use a, 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 a collection, a mare to use to collect a semen, which we refer to as a, uh, more or less, a collection mare. Instead of the horse entering the mare, he enters an artificial vagina. And, and we, that's right, basically and we can, it. Right, and we can ejaculate, so the semen goes into a sterile bag. Now, we have uh, some incredible shots of, of birth on film. What, what actually 
is going on uh, when the horse is about to give birth? What are the attendants looking for to make sure that it goes properly? And, and well, the main thing is to look to see if it's, a, it's after the water breaks, water bag as we refer to, is that it is a, it is a normal presentation. That the f two front feet will put it to the parents, the nose will be laying in between the front feet, and uh, 98% of the time, or not even, it'll, uh, if, it, if the normal presentation presents itself, you will get along fine. Occasionally, you'll have one that's a normal presentation, where it'll get the foal will be about halfway out, and the hind legs will get locked up in the pelvic region, and uh, those cases are very severe, and the dystocia have to be, has to be performed. Now, what do you look for post-birth? Uh, many times you see pictures, and I, we have them also, of. Uh, the new gelding trying to stand up and falling down and trying to stand up and falling down, the mother going over. What, what are you looking for in that period, post-birth? Most foals, if he's an average foal, if he's healthy and strong, they'll vary. They'll get up, uh, some will be up within uh, 45 minutes. I've seen them up even sooner than that. But even if a foal, after it arrives, if it doesn't get up for an hour, hour and a half, I'm not too concerned if it appears to be uh, a normal foal. Now, do you try to get them outside as soon as possible? Yes, here we, uh, I try to get our foals out and give them exercise the following day. Now, yeah. how, how long before that horse will be ready to be sold or to be trained to race? Well, when the foals arrive, for example, this season here, they will be sold as the following fall, a year from this fall, as yearlings and uh, go into training that fall and then race as two-year-olds. One thing we didn't talk about was there is a, sp a specific breeding season at Blue Chip. Yes, well, our breeding season uh, starts the February the 15th and ends the 7th of July. <coughs> okay, we talked about breeding, about birth, so on and so forth, and we did mention Most Happy Fella. Quite an incredible horse, Most Happy Fella. In 1980, offspring earning more money than any other horse in the country, or maybe even the well, world. Well, better than that, uh, Gary, in uh, 79 and 80, his offspring won more money of, in any, than any stud of any breed, which in, includes thoroughbred, quarter horse, or well, I could say any breed. Is there any simple answer to what makes Most Happy Fellow such an incredible uh, piece of property? Well, he, of course, uh, his sire has been, been, been phenomenal, met a skipper, but this horse has really, I think Most Happy Fellow has been the greatest filly sire that uh, the industry has, has ever had. It, uh, is, he's a... Uh, Plus, he's not only been a great filly sire, of course, his colts have been outstanding, and now we're starting to see his daughters produce. And it appears he's going to be a great broodmare sire. Most happy fella, as we can see on uh, the screen, is, is a little bigger now than when, uh, during racing days. What's, as far as weight goes and, and proportion, how, how much is the difference now between racing and, and between Well, and of course, most happy fella's 14. Uh, and he's matured, a mature, and I would say most happy fellow is somewhere in the, somewhere in the neighborhood of uh, between uh, 11 and 1200 now, where when he's probably racing weight somewhere in the 900 to 1000. Obviously, you weren't born into being a farm manager. How, what's your uh, background in, in uh, with well, horses? Well, uh, I've been exposed to it practically all my life. My grandfather was a horse trainer. That's when I had my first exposure. Did you ever drive or? Yes, years ago I dr drove for a while. Where are some of the places that you drove at? Well, we're all over the country from uh, Sedalia, Missouri to New York. And when did you go into the, uh, the business of running a farm? About 24 years ago. So you've mm -hmm. been in this part of the industry for about 24 years? Yes. I'm looking for another 24, I imagine. Well, I certainly hope so. Bill, thanks a lot. Listen, it's been a real pleasure, Gary. Mr. Bill Brown, the farm manager of Blue Chip Farms, and we thank him for joining us on the Inside Track. Promotional considerations for the inside track provided by Carlos's Restaurant, the best Italian food in Sullivan County. Lefty's Charbroil, the better burger place. Kessler Brothers Butchers, Kessler's label enhances your table. The Bagel Bakery, famous for bagel treats and sandwiches, open seven days. House of Lions, fine dining in a country and atmosphere. Dunkin' Donuts, it's worth the trip, open 24 hours. Ellery's Betty Bright Cleaners, now in Monticello and the Ellenville IGA. Capito Brothers Tire Specialists, for family care of your tire needs. The Holiday Inn Restaurant of Liberty, diversity in dining for the public appetite. And the Linyan Chinese Restaurant, 
Authentic Chinatown delights right here in Sullivan County. Welcome back to the Inside Track. We are taking you from the farm onto the farm. John Manzi is with me now. The professor in his final TV appearance, live Jesus, TV appearance of 1981, already. wearing his famous turtle jacket uh, here it is, dug right. up from Mongop River. Right there. How you doing, Sus? <laughs> Good to be here. You know, no, in, okay. no insults to the close anymore. I love it. I love it. <laughs> We're going to go to Westchester County for the second leg of the Pacing Triple Crown, the Kane Pace from Yonkers Raceway. Tell us a little bit about the cane and uh, how you looked at the race before it went off. Okay, it's the cane pace, Gary, is the second leg of the Triple Crown. A very rich event this year, I think it was almost 400,000, 393,000. It's raced in two divisions and a race off. And uh, our good friend, uh, Jimmy Morona, was, he won it uh, with Larry Roller's horse, Wildwood Jeb. Now a nice three year old. In this race, of course, was Seahawk Hanover, who had won the first leg of the Pacing Triple Crown, the Messenger from and this Roosevelt. Meant, and this meant a lot to uh, a Seahawk Hanover. Had he won this event and gone on to win the Triple Crown, it, it meant maybe $2 million more in syndication value. But uh, it was not to be, uh, as uh, Seahawk Hanover, who won the first division very leisurely, uh, he had everything his own way. In the final event, starting from the rail, his horse made a break in the first turn. It was a little disputed. Uh, it was a late claim of foul against Jimmy Marone, but uh, he, uh, Jimmy's horse, Wildwood Jeb, uh, didn't do anything wrong, and the uh, horse didn't stand up. Okay, let's go back in time then to the 22nd of August, a Saturday evening at Yonkers Raceway, and we're going to show you the stretches of the first two divisions and the complete final. So let's set the stage for you. Saturday, August 22nd, the first division of the Kane Pace with a stretch call, Mr. Bob Meyer. Four turns, Seahawk Hanover in front by a length and a quarter. Brand new fellow second, Amaro on the rail third. Conquered the outside fourth. Land Grant Fox and Aloni inside fifth. Brett's advantage the far outside sixth. They come to the top of the pitch. Seahawk Hanover in front by a length and a quarter. Brand new fellow second, Amaro third. Through the stretch, Seahawk Hanover in front by two. Brand new fellow second, Seahawk Hanover in front. John, Seahawk Hanover, two minutes and very, two fifths. Very wire easy to wire. Win. Wire to wire victory over uh, brand new fellow, New York Brett, who raced in our race. A supplementary entry for 25000 I'd like to add, too, Wildwood Jeb was also a supplementary entry. That means for $25,000 that they put up, the owners put up, these horses bought into the race. And uh, Wild uh, Seahawk Hanover, pardon me, took the front, coasted over the three quarters in 132-1, and one, and just jogged home in two minutes and two-fifths, 28-1 and one at the end. An easy winner. Looked like a real easy shoe in, in the, second, uh, in the uh, final division. Okay, that was my next question. If Seahawk Hanover had won the second division... Or the, was Seahawk well, Hanover it, in the second it's, division? It's not a race like... It's not like the Hamilton. No, no, it's not. It's just the two uh, divisions and the race off. And, and the purse of 390000 or 393 is is divided up so much for the first division, so much for the second division, and so much for the final. As compared to the, the Hamiltonian, Keats, which is ha the and Hamiltonian. The Hamiltonian is uh, the, the overall summary is paid to the... The final purse pays the, off the overall summary. In other words, if you were third in the first division and out, and you didn't get third in the summary, you get no money at all. Okay. And that's why he is the professor giving us those answers that maybe you or I, especially I, <laughs> may not know. Let's then go to the second division of the Kane Pace and let you see Wildwood Jeb win that division. Larry Roller's horse, uh, Wildwood Jeb. He stabled at Monticello. Our good friend Larry Roller is the trainer of this horse, and he assigned the uh, driving duties to uh, Jimmy Marone this time. He also had one in the first division, Brett's Advantage, and uh, Buddy Gilmore drove that, but the horse uh, didn't make the final. He finished fifth. And... Uh, Larry's uh, been training horses for some 20 odd years around New York. A good trainer, a real good trainer, and a good driver, too. The background from the professor. The second division of the Kane Pace, Saturday, August 22nd. Let's go once again to the monitor and Mr. Bob Meyer. Six, lap six, seven. Three quarters, one, 30, and four. Around the far turn, Wildwood Jeb in front by length. French Chef the outside second, Eastern Skipperoni inside third. Freedom Fellow the outside fourth, Armbow Wolf on the rail fifth. No, no, Nero six, lap six, seven. They come to the top of the stretch. Wildwood Jeb in front by a length and a quarter. Eastern Skipper goes to the outside. Second on Brobo third. Through the stretch, Wildwood Jeb and Eastern Skipper. Wildwood Jeb and Eastern Skipper there. Heads apart. Wildwood Jeb won that race 159 and 1. And I think what's interesting for Monticello Raceway fans is Freedom Fellow, the winner of the Classic, was in that division, came in fifth, did not even qualify for the race. -off. Nowhere. Wildwood Jeb, uh, a 23 to 1 outsider, Gary. And he's a free legged pacer. If. Uh, 
Uh, racing fans don't know what that means. A free-legged pacer is a horse that races without hobbles, like his daddy. His daddy, Steady Star, was a free-legged pacer and the former world champion. 152 was his record before Nia <laughs> Trust Lord. You are throwing all of these we, facts we get, out we today. We're getting stats in for the last show. <laughs> all these okay. stats. What we're going to do now is see the final of the Kane Pace, the second leg of the Pacing Triple Crown. And as John mentioned before, there was an incident around the first turn. We'll talk about that as they go off to the first uh, part of the race, okay, and then so we'll bring it back to the United All right, so if George will bring it up uh, from the control room, let's go now to the final of the Kane Pace from Yonkers Raceway. Okay, uh, Gary, you see Hawk Hanover is at the rail, Wildwood Jeb is at the two-hole. Jimmy Marone is getting a little close to Seahawk Hanover here, but not, not enough to bother him, though Seahawk Hanover right there goes off stride. And Eastern Skipper and Hervé Fillion, who uh, is challenging Wildwood Jeb for the lead, decides now that he cannot take the lead. Uh, Jimmy will not give it up. He, Jimmy has the lead, Jimmy Marone, and, and uh, Hervé has to settle back in for the two-hole. And let's hear Bob Meyer talk about it. Fifth, Seahawk Hanover back pacing sixth. French Chef seventh, Land Grant is eighth. Quarter time is 28 and one. At the paddock turn the first time, Wildwood Jeb in front by length. The Eastern Skipper has dropped in second. A gap of two and a half lengths, brand new fellow third, Ombro Wolf fourth. The Marrow on the rail fifth, Seahawk Hanover alongside sixth. Two lengths back to French Chef seventh, Land Grant is eighth. As they come by the stands the first time, Wildwood Jeb in front by a length and a half, Eastern Skipper on the rail second. Brand new fellow up on the outside third. The Marrow on the inside fourth, Ombro Wolf alongside fifth, Seahawk Hanover sixth. Half time, one minute, three fifths. Around the clubhouse turn the second time, Wildwood Jeb maintaining a length advantage. Brand new fella up on the rim second. Eastern Skipperloni inside third, Ombro Wolf the outside fourth. Namero on the rail fifth, Seahawk Hanover alongside sixth. Land Grand seventh, French Chef is eighth. Down the back stretch, brand new fella on the outside gets his neck in front. Wildwood Jeb hanging tough on the rail second. Eastern Skipperloni inside third, Ombro Wolf alongside fourth. Three quarters, one, 29 and four. Around the far turn, Wildwood Jeb on the inside, brand new fella on the outside, head and head, nose to nose for the lead. Eastern Skipper on the rail, third, Ombro Wolf alongside fourth. Gap of a length and a half, Seahawk Hanover over the outside fifth. They come to the top of the stretch, Wildwood Jeb on the inside leads by a length, brand new fella second, Eastern Skipper third, Ombro Wolf the far outside. That's Wildwood Jeb with brand new fella, and Eastern Skipper, Wildwood Jeb, ear for him. Wildwood Jeb, 158 and 1. Last the half. Of the pace. Last half and 57 and 3. And as you saw on the monitor, Hervé Fillion sitting right on his back with Easton Skipper. Could not shake loose. But he did get loose within the, the last 50 feet and stuck his horse's head up in between Jimmy Marone and the rail and dead heated uh, brand new fella for the place position. Now, the third leg of the pacing triple crown, for those who might not know, right, is the that, Little Brown Jeb. That comes in September. That's at Delaware, Ohio. The uh, Probably the biggest. The biggest. Uh, 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 fan uh, thing. They have maybe 60,000 people to go out to Delaware, Ohio. It's a, it's a great spectacle. The Little Brown Jug. Is it unusual for a supplemental, supplementary entry to win a race as big as this? Yes, I, I think it's, I might be wrong, but I think it's the first time that it's ever happened in the Kane Pace, which has been racing now for some 20 years or 24 years now. And uh, it is unusual, yeah. Okay, the professor with some expert analysis on the cane pace. We'll be back right after this commercial message to show you the Monticello Raceway jackets, talk about fireworks, and show you something else right after this message. You can get loud now. Promotional considerations for the inside track provided by Claire's County Seat Restaurant for a congenial and truly elegant culinary experience. Ralph Cutler's Mail Modes, home of the Sansabelt Slack, free alterations while you wait. The Down Under Lounge. If it ain't happening at the Down Under, it ain't happening. The Canton Restaurant. In Monticello, Chinese means Canton. Open seven days. Skaters World. You can enjoy the racing while the kids enjoy the skating. Willie's Bend and Elbow. Serving dinner, pizza, and sandwiches in a lounge of distinction. Raceway Dining Terrace. Enjoy complete dinners weeknights for $9.95 while you watch the racing. Miss Monticello Diner, the finest in early American homestyle cooking. And Bernie's Holiday Restaurant, food served with a pinch of love. Trivia time now on the inside track, as I was caught with my jacket on. What is that here? Those are the jackets we're giving you. That is nice. I'm jacket day. Let's go to trivia right now. Last week's question, the first triple crown pacing triple crown winner. Adios Butler, who was the driver, Professor? Clint Hodgins, not Eddie Cobb. And correctly answered by not E.F. Hutton, but I.F. Bega of South Fallsburg, New York. And he wins dinner for two in our Raceway Dining Terrace. That's for you, I.F. 
Insufficient funds. Insufficient we know funds. Well. Next week's question. This week's question. Okay, who was the first guest on the Inside Track's first broadcast? That's he, right. Even Joe Tadaro doesn't know that one, our and director. You can write to the Inside Track, Monticello Raceway, Monticello, New York, and you too can win dinner for two, just like I have Bagon. He might eat those dinner for two himself. <laughs> Professor, coming <laughs> up September 3rd, 4th, and 5th. Fan Big, appreciation night, right. September 3rd. Big weekend, right? Free, free parking, free admission, September 3rd. Thursday. And this, is, Friday, this is Friday. September 4th, a beautiful jacket given away to all fans at no extra charge. First 6,000 paying adults, 500 children. That's true. September 5th, fireworks extravaganza beautiful. after the races. And September 7th, Monday, Labor Day matinee racing. Only. Coming up September 13th, we have an I Love New York Day featuring Yonkers versus Monticello Raceway drivers. Right, and, and uh, on that program, Jimmy Marone, Buddy Gilmore, Carmine Abatello, and Joe Marsh will race against Bill Fitzgerald, Ronnie Ingrassia, John Gilmore, and Gary Messenger. And we have a big I Love New York Day featuring the Monticello Raceway flower display, buttons, posters, and a whole lot more. And right now, we're going to let you see what might take place. Let's go to the monitor. That's September 13th at Monticello Raceway, the I Love New York Day. Professor, your last live broadcast. You will be on next week on tape. Give me one hey bro handshake. Thank <laughs> you and good night. <laughs> <The> professor, <laughs> and my thanks, of course, to Bill Brown and uh, all those people who made that segment possible. Remember, next week, the best of the inside track. See you then. Meet you at fun.